I don't think so. Okay, welcome everyone to our regular meeting of council for Tuesday, April 23rd at 2 p.m. We will call our meeting to order um, and recognize that we're holding our meeting on the unceded traditional territories of the Sushot and Hoopachesset First Nations. Uh, councilors, are there any late items? None. City Clerk, any late items? None, Madam Mayor. Great. Uh, would somebody like to move approval of the agenda? So moved. Second, Madam Mayor. All in favor? Carried. And we have minutes from the special meeting of council held at 1 p.m. on April 8, 2019, and a regular council meeting held at 2 p.m. on April 8, 2019. Move to adopt. Second. Second. All in favor? Carried. And that brings us to public input period, which is an opportunity for the public to address council on topics of relevance to city council. Would anybody like to speak? Wow. Are we sure that nobody would like to speak? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Seeing no speakers, on to delegations. And the first one is Inspector Brian Hunter here to introduce our new RCMP Operations Support Sergeant. Come on forward. Thank you, Worship. Council? It uh, gives me a great pleasure today to introduce to the community uh, Sergeant Peter Dion, who uh, recently arrived at the detachment, started last week. Uh, Peter came to us uh, from uh, Bella Bella Detachment, where he was the detachment commander there. He has over 25 years service, lots of experience, and uh, for those who used to work with uh, Sergeant Dave Boyce, and I know Peter's tired of hearing that, this is the, <laughs> the new Dave Boyce, and uh, I'll let Peter uh, introduce himself further. Thank you. Thank you all for inviting me here today, and uh, I uh, appreciate your comments about uh, holding this meeting on unceded uh, Sishat and Hoopachesset uh, territory, and I uh, appreciate being invited uh, into the territories as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I am Dave Boyce Light. I'm still in the learning curve. <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, facets of my job I'm just getting, uh, getting a hold of, as well as uh, finishing off the uh, obligations of my, uh, my transfer here. But uh, my wife and I selected Port Al Alberni as our first choice, and we're uh, delighted when the opportunity uh, arose for us to come here. Um, we're uh, very, very impressed with the uh, community thus far. Very happy with the detachment personnel on site and the uh, work ethic and uh, and uh, team spirit. And uh, my wife is uh, telling me daily uh, how impressed she is with the friendliness and helpfulness of the uh, community. So we're both uh, very, very pleased to be here. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing Port Alberni. Um, you've got a great people group of people to work with at the detachment, and we're looking forward to having you. Council, any questions or comments? Okay, Councillor Haggard. I just want to say welcome to Port Alberni. I was very happy to hear you say that we were our first choice, so thank you for coming here. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, and thank you so much. Thank um, you. I am uh, I know you've got a lot to do, and uh, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, and welcome to Port Alberni. Thank you very much. Okay, and next from the Alzheimer's Society, we have Pam Craig in attendance to provide information on the upcoming Investors Group Wealth Management Walk for Alzheimer's. Thank you very much, Mayor Minions, and good afternoon, councillors. I really appreciate this opportunity to come today to uh, speak about our special event that's happening on May 5th. And the IG Wealth Management Group is sponsoring a uh, walk for Alzheimer's in uh, British Columbia. And on Sunday, May 5th, the Port Alberni uh, community will join 21 other communities in the province to celebrate and remember people who have been affected by dementia. And dementia is a term that describes a group of brain disorders. And symptoms include loss of memory, impaired judgment, changes in behavior and personality. But dementia is progressive, degenerative, and eventually terminal. So on Sunday, May 5th, Port Alberni volunteers and families affected by Alzheimer's disease and other dementias will gather at Blair Park at 9.30 to raise funds and awareness about and for dementia research. 
Some of the statistics are uh, quite startling. I'd just like to share with you that an estimated 70,000 British Columbians are currently living with dementia, and this number is expected to more than double in the next 20 years. And there is approximately 10,000 British Columbians living with dementia under the age of 60. And my sister-in-law was diagnosed with dementia at age 46. Nearly three years of British, nearly three quarters of British Columbians think people living with dementia exper experience stigma. And two, thir two in three British Columbians have personally known someone who is living with dementia. But I channel channels or challenge that statistic because with the increase in diagnosis and understanding around dementia, I firmly believe every one of us will know someone that has had this disease. So GI Wealth Management Walks for Alzheimer's in British Columbia on May 5th will honor a person who has lived with dementia or a person or group of people who have invaluably contributed to the lives of those affected by the disease. In Port Alberni, the Alzheimer's Walk honoree this year is Jory Mitchell. And Jory and his wife Robin were very popular teachers in School District 70. And when Robin was diagnosed with dementia, Jory devoted his life to support and care for her. And in a recent article in the newspaper, Alberni Valley uh, News, Jory was quoted as saying, it hits you out of nowhere. It always took me by surprise. These were times I was mainly caught off guard. I had to get over the shock, come up with a plan, and execute it. And the Alzheimer's Society supported me in ways I never knew possible. So Joy's words tell us only a small bit of those challenges families face when caring for loved ones struggling with dementia. And the Alzheimer's Walk event provides a space for people to remember or honor people who, whose lives have been touched by dementia while they fundraise to look for, towards a world without dementia and support those living with the disease today. So by attending the Sunday, May 5th Walk for Alzheimer's in Port Alberni, you will join many others in reducing the stigma, in raising crucial public awareness about the disease and showing your support to the people affected. Funds raised will go towards local support and learning opportunities for people and families living with dementia. Those who participate in Port Alberni Walk will bring us one step closer to a dementia-friendly society, a place where people affected by dementia are welcomed, acknowledged, and included. So I urge you to register, donate, go to the website walkforalzheimers.ca, and you can do everything there. And on Sunday, May 5th at Blair Park, registration starts at 930 Jory Mitchell will be there and be honored and speak with the uh, people gathering. The walk begins at 1030 along Kasuxa's Dyke, up to where the bridge is, where participants can toss flowers into the water to honor those living with the disease. Uh, this year's Port Alberni Walk coordinators are Noreen Pelk, who's with me today, Lori Smiley, and they can be reached at Port Alberni Walk Chair at alzheimerbc.org. So I'd like to invite councillors to participate maybe form a team, we suggest community members come together and form teams to come and be there on that day. And while you're out doing your counselor duties between now and May 5th, please share this information with as many people as you possibly can. And also another opportunity would be to come along to the community wellness event on Thursday, May 2nd at the Multiplex. Uh, Parks and Rec and Heritage has organized an amazing event with over 70 groups participating. The Alzheimer's Committee will be there accepting pre-registrations and lots of information about uh, all kinds of different healthy living strategies. So today I've brought along a gift for you and again please challenge and share this information. Noreen will help me. We'll give uh, out our special t-shirts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
So once again, thank you very much, and we hope to see you on Sunday, May 5th. Yeah, thank you very much, Council. Are there any questions? Councillor Solta? It's not really a question, but a statement. Um, I know there's a lot of people out in this community who have a loved one that has dementia. Yeah. Uh, my father-in-law was had dementia before he passed away, and, and Robin Mitchell <clears throat> was really well-respected in this community for her yeah. music and as a teacher. Yeah. So it was a great choice. And, yes. um, her her de devotion to students and the choir fests are, are her legacy in our community, and choir fest is on May 2nd. Mm -hmm. so. And I hope one day to see, like I know in Comox they're building a some kind of center for dementia, yeah. and I would love to see that happen in our community and um, I, much needed. Yes. Not that the continuing care homes haven't done something, but this is on a bigger scale. Yeah, we need to take care about what they're doing up there for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Absolutely. all your Thank help. You, yeah. Thanks very much for the work you're both doing on this. Okay, uh, there's no unfinished business today, so on to staff reports. First item is accounts, Councillor Corbeil. Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the certification of the Director of Finance dated April 23rd, 2019 be received and checks numbered 143560 to 143645 inclusive in payment of accounts totaling $727,476.63 be approved. Is there a seconder? I'll second that. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. And on to item two from the Manager of Planning, Development Variance Permit number 91 3541 10th Avenue. Welcome. Hello. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. So before you for consideration um, is an application for a development variance permit uh, to increase the height of a fence in the front yard uh, at 3541 10th Avenue. The applicant wishes to install a fence that is six feet in height uh, in the front yard setback and the reason for the variance is to help <laughs> mitigate the applicant's safety concerns and to create a more private front yard for their personal use. The current regulation, uh, 6.7.3, states that fences, hedges, or walls not greater than 1.25 meters or 4.1 feet in height are permitted within a required front yard. The regulations around fence height are fairly standard and in line with what other communities permit. Um, these regulations are in place to help achieve the following goals promoting a sense of community, walkability, and contact between residents and to present a welcoming and attractive streetscape, to promote public safety through the use of SEPTED, um, crime prevention through environmental design, which encourages low open style fences to improve household security, uh, and to support the house numbering bylaw, uh, bylaw number 3297. The subject property has approximately 12.6 meters of frontage along 10th Avenue. The surrounding area is primarily both commercial and residential, uh, and 10th Avenue is a designated arterial road. The, applica the applicant has brought, for, uh, brought to staff's attention that uh, in various locations across the city, and more specifically along 10th Avenue new, near the subject property, uh, there are other examples of front yard fences uh, or hedges that are above four feet in height. However, with uh, limited staff capacity uh, and many emerging priorities, the bylaw department currently works primarily on a complaint basis, uh, and the department has not been directed to prioritize enforcing uh, to prioritize enforcing height restrictions on front yard fences in the community. The planning department, in coordination with the bylaw services department, will discuss this matter further in an upcoming report to review uh, the zoning bylaws provisions. Uh, with regards to the status of the application, the Advisory Planning Commission passed a motion recommending uh, that Council permit the variance for the subject property in the, form of an, in the form of an additional two feet of lattice on top of a standard front yard fence. The recommendation proposed by the Advisory Planning Commission should meet some of the needs of the applicant while also mitigating challenges that would limit, visibi limit visibility of the property. Council received the APC's recommendation and notification was given as required by the Local Government Act. Only one person corresponded with the Planning Department about the proposed variance. Uh, the, the Planning Department supports the issuing of the Development Variance Permit number 91 for the property at 3541 10th Avenue as recommended by the Advisory Planning Commission. Thank you. Council, are there any questions on the report? 
Okay, Councillor Haggard, would you like to move the first mo motion, which is receipt of the report? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the report dated April 16, 2019 from the Manager of Planning regarding proposed development variance permit number 91 be received and Council proceed with consideration of the development variance permit at 3541 10th Avenue. Is there a seconder? Second. Okay. All in favor? Carried. And moving on, I'm assuming that was our background information from the Manager of Planning. <laughs> City Clerk, is there any correspondence for this matter? Madam Mayor, there is one email dated April 2nd, 2019 from Mr. John Hans, and it states concern for the overall height of the proposed front yard fence. Okay, thank you. And any late correspondence on this matter? None, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And next is presentation by the applicant, if you wish. <coughs> Hello, my name is Callum Adams. I live at 3541 10th Avenue, Port Alberni. Uh, I've lived there for about a year and I work at Alberni Continuing Care Society with people with Alzheimer's patients, generally. Um, and my partner is a French immersion kindergarten teacher. So uh, prior to applying for this application, my initial consideration was that I would raise my retaining wall because uh, you can build a retaining wall of 4.9 feet with no building permit. And then on top of that, subject to having the grade at the same height as the retaining wall, you would then be able to build a four foot fence on top of that. So of 4.1 feet, so totaling a total of nine feet uh, in total. So when I originally applied, I never really expected it to be such a matter of contention because I thought I was essentially applying for permission to have it be composed more of fence than of retaining wall. And the reason I applied was because I felt it would provide a better characteristic for my property and for the community and everything. And that's why I paid the $600 fee to apply and we're now in the fifth month of this. So uh, yeah, I, I recognize your guys' concerns and I've read the report um, about crime prevention and there's been a lot of uh, grasps onto the providing a line of sight into the property and there were also three other things that it mentions in the report and it recognizes maintenance territorial reinforcement and natural access control and i do feel that my fence will provide for these three other uh, things that it lists in it and actually my front door will be visible and i'm intending to put my uh, my number on the front of the fence so that it's easily visible to uh, emergency services when they respond. So I was hoping to have a very nice wooden fence. I was gonna put a finish on it. I brought some photos, if you guys would care to review them, of some other fences in the neighborhood that are actually six feet tall that are similar to the one that I was wanting to build. Uh, I feel like when I made my application, I kind of gave some photos that maybe didn't reflect as positively as possible on you know, how, how nice a, a nice fence could look mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. So I, I kind of did some scouting around and found a couple within two or three blocks of me that were very nice looking fences that I thought had a positive impact on the characteristic of the neighborhood. So I'm hoping to provide that. And uh, I, I understand that you know, there, there was a condition suggested that it be composed of lattice at the front. And I was really hoping to avoid that type of material. I ripped off some old broading falling apart lattice from my property when I first purchased it. And you know, it's held together with just little finishing nails and they're rusting kind of already when I went to the lumber store to look at it. And so I actually took some photos in the lumber store showing the finishing nails rusting already. And I just won't be able to achieve the same level of finish that I'm hoping to get with my fence using that lattice I'm hoping to you know put a varnish on it and have it look very nice where I can come back and re-varnish it and kind of maintain it at a very nice level so yeah and you know I thought originally seeing as there was no provision uh, listed anywhere in the in the bylaw when I read it for a requirement of providing a line of sight into your property anywhere so you know like I said you could have a combined height of nine feet between your retaining wall and fence and there's no requirement to provide uh, a line of sight into your property. And I've read up on 
the bylaws in other districts and municipalities and everything. And there are other ones in line with ours that permit only a four foot fence, but there are others that have no height limit and allow six foot fences and eight foot fences. And just a few blocks from my house, or not even a few blocks, a block and a half from my house is commercial property where they're permitted eight foot fences and to build right up to the corner of the property line. So I don't feel that it's particularly uncharacteristic for my neighborhood. Um, I recognize John's uh, letter they wrote in. I actually know him personally. He's my next door neighbor. Uh, some photos that I included in my application of, you know, the yard next door to me uh, were photos of John's yard. So I thought it was pretty surprising that he'd be concerned about the characteristic of the neighborhood, just kind of considering the upkeep that's occurring at his property. But I, I don't know if maybe the bylaw department stopped by and talked to him about that and it was done in a retaliatory fashion. So yeah, I, I, I'm hoping to maintain this fence at a high level. You know, I'm a young person. I've come here and invested a lot of money in the interior of my home. And now I'm kind of transitioning to focusing on the exterior of my home and hoping to kind of be able to create a nice usable space at both the front and rear of my property. We're planning on moving into our secondary suite to kind of pay off our reno. And we were hoping the front yard was going to be our outdoor space that was going to be private for us where we'd be able to barbecue and sit and enjoy with our friends and family and kind of have a private space where we'd be able to enjoy. Secondary suites are permitted in our neighborhood, in our home and on our lot and everything. So, yeah, I think that, you know, we have so much trouble with affordable housing these days and that, you know, we hope to eventually leave our home as a rental property and purchase another, you know, home that needs a little bit of love in the community and fix it up. And so, you know, we're going to be raising our tax contribution and we've made our nice contribution in the form of our application fee and everything. And so, and we, and we hope to revitalize another home after this one, right? And, and leave the people who take it over as tenants with a nice private outdoor space. And we think that they are entitled to that, whether they're utilizing the front yard or the rear. I know that traditionally people would sort of say, well, you know, you can barbecue in your backyard, but as our densities change in our cities and people start to kind of look to their front yards as possibly being a utilizable space, you know, it's, it's something that maybe we should consider is allowing people to have a private space there that they can use as an outdoor space for a secondary suite or something like that. I think that, you know, it's, it's definitely something to consider. So yeah, thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay, seeing no questions here. Thank you very much and okay. we'll go to input from the public next. Okay. Would any members of the public like to speak to this issue? Okay, no members of the public. Okay, and any questions from council? Councillor Solda. Um, Madam Mayor, I would like to hear what the inspector has to say because I'm reading this crime prevention through environmental design and I'm just curious to know how does that reflect into our community? This is from the North Vancouver RCMP Depat Depat Detachment, and so I would like to hear his comments, if you don't want to. Absolutely. So, Inspector Hunter, we know you haven't been necessarily following this specific application process, so if no, your comments today, are general, that's fine. <laughs> so, I, I think the issue would be is if you're creating a fortress in, in a home um, and uh, listening to the applicant, there is uh, a clear view from uh, their doorway if they were looking out. Um, I'm not going to wade into this specific example, but Septed certainly uh, we do uh, look at fences and it's a two-fold way, right? Uh, you want people from the public to be able to see into people's houses if things are happening to call and prevent that but also there's a sense of security within your home to keep people out so there is a, a fine balance uh, with that okay. thank you very much Councillor Corbiel yeah I just like to point out I'm glad to hear that the, the manager of uh, planning talked about uh, this is going to be revisited um, you know, it's a, it's a very prescriptive talking about four feet when we should probably be looking more at, you know, what are our, our goals and objectives? As the inspector said, uh, you know, visibility has got to be one 
uh, community uh, aesthetics is another. And, you know, hopefully we go down the road. I'd much rather see a six foot fence that looks, that's well kept versus a four foot sheet of plywood across the front of somebody's yard. So, um, you know, to, to the applicant's uh, uh, variance, I, I'm totally in favor of it. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Manager of Planning. Would it be all right if I just clarify one thing really quickly? Absolutely. Um, with regards to retaining walls under uh, 6.7.2, under fe uh, fences and hedges of the general provisions of the zoning bylaw, it says that um, the height of a fence, hedge, or wall erected along a retaining wall shall be determined by the measurement from the ground level at average grade. Um, so that means it's not on top of the retaining wall, it's at average grade of the, uh, of the the yard behind so the retaining be nine wall. Feet. If the retaining wall, um, if, if the grade is at the same height as uh -huh. the retaining wall, so yeah, because it's measured uh, one meter. Back. So we have to get you to, yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to come forward. So um, it says that the height of the fence is measured from the level at the average grade within one meter of the side which is supported by the retaining wall. So if you were to build a retaining wall and backfill that retaining wall one meter back and ra raise it up to the same height as the retaining wall, you would then have your fence height measured from that level of grade. So the level of the soil there being supported by the retaining wall. So I think that might be somewhat outside of the intent of the bylaw. <laughs> intent, but you know, <laughs> it, it's, still, it's still there and, and sure. you, you know, it is, it is a way to get around it. You know, I've always been a creative person and I understand that I'm slightly alternative and have gone through this process and everything, but I've found being an alternative person that the best way to succeed is to stick and try and work within the rules and, and that's what I've done here, right? So. Okay. Thank you. Council, any more questions? Councillor Silva. It, it's not a question, but I just found it interesting on these pictures that we see of the hedges and, and the two different shots here and how high they are. And I, I hope when we um, look at our bylaws for this, this is all going to be in the package deal here because they are the same thing as what's being presented to us, but it's a fence. And these are hedges that are quite tall. Thank you. Sure. Councillor Haggard, do you have any comments or questions? Okay. Councillor Corbiel. Okay. Councillor Corbiel, would you like to read the motion? Yes, Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the development variance permit number 91 to vary the zoning bylaw regulations to permit an increase in the height of a front yard fence at 3541 10th Avenue be authorized by the City Council on April 23rd, 2019. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Okay, seeing no further questions, all in favor? Carried. Okay, on to item three from the Director of Finance, 2018 Year End Audit. Councillor Soldo, would you like to make this motion? I'll move it. I'll move that the report dated March 18th, 2019 from the Director of Finance regarding the 2018 Year End Audit timeline be received. Okay, seconder. Seconder. And are there any questions for the Director of Finance on this report? Councillor Soldo. I'm just kind of curious to know about the deadline and that why our auditor just couldn't do the deadline because like give me more information on that because they know that we do this every year this is nothing new to them so I don't have any control over what the auditors timelines are we were just informed that we had to have everything done by a, a date that wasn't quite possible to meet so so another question is so there was no they didn't give us enough time, obviously. So what kind of notice did they give us on this? Well, we were informed in January that there was a possibility if we didn't have everything absolutely done 100% by March 4th, I believe it was. And considering the complexity of the city's accounting systems and the resources that I have in my staff, um, we made about 75%, which is quite an accomplishment in itself, but we weren't at 100%, so they said, no, you have to wait till May because we have other, um, they're focusing on their other parts of their practice. And can you refresh 
approached me on our deadline date to have everything done. May 15th is a provincial filing deadline, mm -hmm. which there won't be a problem having everything into the province by then. We just won't have the formal sign off done. Okay, it's just disappointing that, you know, we've been with this auditor for how long? Do you have a, how long have we been with this? Prior to our Anderson purchasing the firm, I think we were with um, Duncan Sabine yes. Collier and Partners for about 40 years. Mm -hmm. That's really disappointing. So I just wanted to voice that publicly. What would be a normal time frame? When would we normally be doing our audit? Right now. So this close to the May 15th deadline is when we would normally do it? Yeah, in April. Uh, they have all of the information, just so you know that they have been supplied with everything, so. Okay. Any other questions from council? Okay, thank you. So we have a motion on the table. Seeing no further questions, all in favor? Carried. And from the manager of bylaw services, update on remedial action requirement for 4781 Margaret Street. Manager of bylaw services. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, this report is just informative for council. Um, as you recall, on March 11th, uh, council un unanimously passed a resolution to impose a remedial action requirement on uh, 4781 Margaret Street, which um, was declared a nuisance and a remedial action requirement imposed to ensure that the building was demolished um, due to the fire damage and, and the issues that that property was um, facing. So the deadline for completion was 5 p.m. on April 12th uh, of this year. Um, we received no response from the property owner uh, despite many attempts to be in contact. Um, there's been no repeal, or sorry, appeal request and um, it's our understanding that, that the property owner has, has walked away and this will be the responsibility of the city at this time. Um, in my March 11th report, I provided some nine points of next steps in the process should we have to go through the, the remedial action. Um, so we would start at the first step, which is just um, doing on-site inspections to determine the amount of work required. Um, and it is worth noting uh, on a recent check that the property's taxes have um, come out of arrears. So um, they have been paid to date, um, which makes me optimistic that uh, by the city taking on the demolition work, um, putting them back on tax arrears, that the city will recover the costs for this property. Okay, thank you. Council, any questions? Okay, Councillor Haggard, would you like to read the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the report dated April 16th, 2019 from the Manager of Bylaw Services, providing an update on the remedial action requirement imposed on 4781 Margaret Street be received. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Carried. And item five from the Manager of Bylaw Services, special event permits. This is just an update date on the special event permits that are being applied for this year. Council, are there any questions? Councilor Soltak. Just, just a quick question. Is it less than we nor normally, there's a lot more. Is that, is it the same amount as last time or is there? City Clerk. I'll take this one on. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> um, the, the main organizations, we have, we have our typical main events, the Toy Run, the Fall Fair, Salmon Festival, um, fantastic event. And um, we sometimes have some smaller events that uh, have come forward previously. Um, we didn't get any applications for them at this time. It doesn't mean that they won't as the year goes on or that we can't consider them at a later time. But uh, certainly all our, our major event um, organizers attended the meeting. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Solda, could you read that motion? Uh, yes. Madam Mayor, I move that the Council for the City of Porto Verde endorses special event permit application for 2019 as reviewed April 11, 2019, providing all the provisions of the provincial liquor licensing requirements are met and the applicants notified accordingly. Second, Madam Mayor. Any questions or comments? All in favor? carried and managers reports the first one from the director of parks recreation and heritage <laughs> 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 
Welcome, Director Thorpe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, you have my monthly uh, report in front of you there. And the one thing I wanted to bring to your attention, as Ms. Craig mentioned, we are hosting a community wellness extravaganza on Thursday, May 2nd. She didn't call it an extravaganza. <laughs> which, is, which is why I'm here, so she wouldn't take my thunder. <laughs> and so we're holding this community wellness extravaganza next Thursday, so May uh, 2nd. It is free for families to come and attend from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the multiplex. And we have upward of 80 vendors at this stage that will uh, will be attending. So we encourage community to come out and I'd be happy to answer any questions about my report. Thank you, any questions? No questions. Thank you very much for your report. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Corbiel, could you move your seat? Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the monthly report from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage providing information about current departmental operations be received. Seconder? Yes. Second, Madam Mayor. All in favor. Carried. And from the RCMP, Inspector Hunter. We'll call this the less fun report, I think. I, I, it'll be a fun <laughs> report. Won't be an extravaganza, but it's a <laughs> fun report. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Your Worship and, and Council. Uh, before I, I get into my report here, I just want <laughs> to uh, address with Council um, a change in crime reporting that's uh, happened effective January 1st, 2019, uh, across the country. Uh, every policing agency uh, has to conform to the reporting requirements of Statistics Canada. Uh, when we receive a, a file, any file, uh, of the 12,000 uh, we receive in, in a year, we call it, we, we score the file. We categorize it, and it's, uh, it can be quite a, a complex uh, process. And from that, Statistics Canada uh, pulls out their stats for annual reports, the Crime Severity Index, the province of BC pulls out those reports. Uh, you've seen uh, police resources in BC, uh, policing in BC, uh, Councillor Corbeil, I think you've reviewed that report. All of these numbers are pulled from these uh, statistics. Uh, as some may recall, uh, Last year, there was a report out by the Globe and Mail uh, talking about sexual assaults uh, in Canada. And there was a, a great discussion on uh, a proportion of these reports were uh, considered uh, unfounded or unsubstantiated. And uh, that report is the uh, catalyst for change by Statistics Canada. Without getting too far in the weeds, what, what the new reporting system entails, and I'll describe the old reporting system. If we had a file where it's a, a he said, she said, say a sexual assault, uh, there were no witnesses, there was no physical evidence uh, to back up uh, the uh, allegation, there simply wasn't enough evidence to go to court. That file would have been classified as unsubstantiated. We could not substantiate uh, the charge and it would not be reportable to Statistics Canada. There's been a change and what the change is now, uh, if we get a situation like that and we 100% cannot disprove the allegation, i.e. a complete and thorough investigation and at the conclusion of that, you know what, it didn't happen. Now, the category of unsubstantiated does not exist. So that file now becomes a check mark reportable to Statistics Canada as an event that occurred. So the types of files uh, that uh, we'll see an increase in the reporting to Stats Canada and of course in my quarterly reports as well uh, would be the uh, harassments, cause of uh, disturbance, uh, sexual assault, some assault files, um, and uh, um, we don't know exactly uh, what this will look like. The end of the year will certainly uh, tell us that, and Statistics Canada is uh, uh, preparing for that come January 2020 reporting uh, statistics and what they look like. I can tell you when it comes to property crimes, that was never really an issue. If something was stolen from you uh, in your vehicle, your home, it was pretty black and white. We uh, may not have been able to prove who took it, uh, but that was reportable to Stats Canada. So the property offenses uh, generally will not change. Uh, some of the uh, person's crimes will. Um, 
One other change in Statistics Canada, which uh, is going to drastically in increase our property crime offenses, are frauds. Uh, previous uh, to the new uh, reporting system, if we received a phone call, the Nigerian scam, the CRA scams, the thousands of those that occur, uh, hundreds of thousands of those occur on a daily basis across the country, uh, we wouldn't take a report on that unless they were literally, they gave somebody the $2,000 and they were out the 2000 If it was reporting for info purposes, uh, we would tell them, you know, that's a scam, uh, kind of, uh, ignore it, delete those emails, that type of thing. Or they could call uh, phone busters, which was the OPP in Ontario would receive phone calls about these things. Stats Canada now wants, uh, every time this happens, for us to report on it. So frauds are going to go through the roof compared to previous reporting. Uh, if somebody calls in and said, I got the Nigerian scam letter, we now have to open a file on that. We're not going to investigate it because uh, it would take literally thousands of persons hours to deep, deep into the internet and then get uh, a fellow police agency in Nigeria to look into. It's just not going to happen. But it's a quick file that's open and it's now reportable to Stats Canada. So those, I just want uh, council and the community to be uh, aware of those uh, changes with Stats Canada. Um, that said, our overall calls for service for the quarter were up from 2,285 up to 2,455. So our calls for service uh, were up. I'm going to make uh, Flynn go back and forth on that uh, <laughs> screen because I'm going to go back here. So uh, we had a total of 3,054 calls for the entire detachment. Uh, and of those, 2,455 occurred in the city of Port Alberni. Uh, criminal offenses are up 17% for the quarter. Uh, property crime is up 15%, and violent crime is up significantly uh, for the quarter. And it's largely driven uh, by uh, the number uh, of assaults. I will uh, just briefly outline, we had uh, a few major crimes that occurred in uh, the period. Uh, there were two armed robberies, one at the 7-Eleven and the following day at the Barclay uh, Liquor Store. Uh, we solved that crime the next day. We made an arrest, uh, somebody that uh, was in, in the community here, and uh, they are on, uh, currently on a 24-hour curfew, not in this community. Uh, they're in uh, another community, uh, I believe not even on Vancouver Island. Uh, we also had an attempted murder uh, investigation, and uh, you may have seen in the media, we're looking, there were warrants out uh, for that person who went into hiding, and we have since uh, captured them, and, and they remain in custody. Uh, I'll just go through a couple of uh, the offenses here. Uh, assaults uh, from 39 uh, to 81, uh, that is a, a dramatic increase. I reviewed all 81 of these files prior to the meeting uh, to get a grasp and um, explain to the community that um, these aren't stranger on stranger uh, assaults that are happening uh, in this community. Uh, we know the offenders in uh, all of those uh, 81 files except for one. <coughs> Most have been cleared by arrests and, and people charged. Uh, of the 81, there are two files uh, where it uh, wasn't known people uh, involved in the event. Uh, one was a uh, cab driver, a no-pay fare, got into uh, an altercation uh, with the client. And the other was a client at the overdose prevention site uh, that uh, uh, assaulted one of the volunteers there. All the other files, uh, these are, uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are uh, familial in nature. Uh, a lot of them are friends, and certainly drugs and alcohol are a contributing factor. And um, when I say Port Alberni is a, a safe place to be, it, it is. And um, like I said earlier, we're not having stranger on stranger assaults. You can go to other communities where it's not safe to walk through the park and, and uh, uh, various attacks and assaults are taking place. That's not what's happening in Port Alberni. These folks uh, know each other and uh, in all 81 of those except for one, uh, we've identified uh, the uh, uh, assailant and most have been cleared by uh, charges. So I wanted to point that out. You will see, um, I want to point out break and enter other went from 21 down to 7. Uh, that's once again, uh, last reporting period uh, last year. Uh, at this time, I reported on an individual that was arrested. Those were 
sheds being broken into on in, uh, properties. And it was an individual responsible for the majority of those. It's just, I'd like to highlight uh, what a chronic offender can do uh, in, in our community. And uh, most, most of these crimes up there, there's no first time criminals uh, with the, uh, most of the statistics that uh, you see here. You'll see fraud went from 21 to 41. Uh, I outlined that at the beginning that those numbers are, are going to be going up and uh, we'll keep uh, having a look at that. Outside of that, uh, anticipating perhaps there was going to be a question of uh, uh, the new shelter in our community and, and what sort of effect that has had. If anyone uh, followed the media in Nanaimo, uh, there were certainly some strong comments made there in regards to two new facilities. Um, our community is different. We've had supports uh, for our residents for, for many, many years. This isn't a situation where we had a tent city with hundreds of people there and we relocated them in, in another area. So the effect of the shelter, uh, I just quickly checked calls that we received at the shelter. It's very few and it's the same as the, the previous shelter. We've had no uh, significant increase in that regard, uh, just in case that was a question that was gonna come up. Thank you very much for your report. Questions from Council? Councillor Corbiel. Yeah, a couple uh, questions, uh, Inspector Hunter. Uh, one thing you hear often in the community is these people have been brought in from, from somewhere else, bust in or whatever the case may be. I'm sure that you would have a pretty good handle on it. Are these people that uh, appear to be the repeat offenders, are they from somewhere else or are they local people? The majority of our uh, repeat offenders, Your Worship, are, they're from the community here. There's been lots of rumors since I, I've been here uh, coming up on three years now. The bus loads show up in the middle of the night and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, I have no evidence that that exists. Do we get folks that come to the community and, and commit crime? Uh, absolutely. And are they re repeat offenders? Absolutely. And those are the ones um, about two councils ago uh, I explained why I feel people that aren't from here, they have no family here, no roots, whatever, come and commit crime, they should be on conditions to no longer be here. Uh, but to, to say that there's busloads of people coming into the community, uh, I don't have any evidence of that. And I, I was looking for a statistic on uh, failure to uh, appear in court. It, it, does that happen quite often? It is an offense, and to say it happens quite often, uh, I would say no, it does happen, and then warrants are issued uh, immediately. Uh, I think the bigger issue for us, uh, Your Worship, is, um, and I don't want to become critical of the judiciary, is just our repeat offenders that we get, especially mm -hmm. those repeat offenders that are bound by conditions, curfew conditions, uh, amongst many others, and while they're on conditions, waiting to go to court for a crime, continually repeat the same crimes over and over. It's just very, very uh, frustrating. We're not the only community that goes through recidivism, but it is a, a very frustrating thing. And that's where, um, you know, our COASA program, uh, working with our indigenous communities, when we are in contact with some of our clients, if we could get them some help, get to the root of the problem to get them out of that circle, those are big wins for us. And on a side note, that program is working uh, very well uh, at the detachment. Uh, I would say um, over 100 uh, referrals already since the program started. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Inspector Hunter. Great, Councillor Solda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a quick question. When you talk about the stats and you talk about so many calls for from Port Albert, just the city itself, is the rest the regional district? So the rest is the regional district or some of our First Nation communities. I will see you tomorrow likely at the regional uh, district yes, board meeting and I'll report on those uh, okay. statistics uh, there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So it's about 80% in the city of Port Alberni. And Councillor Haggard, do you have any questions or comments? Okay, sure. Well, thanks for your report. Um, I think it's really, uh, it's great to hear the comments about um, the new shelter and um, that we're not seeing an impact there. Certainly some communities are seeing very negative um, impacts in the areas of their supportive housing that's been put in. And I'm thrilled to hear that we're not having that here. And I think it's really a testament to, you know, the location of it, how the shelter society works in our community, how they're supporting people and the relationship with the RCMP as well. So. Um, great job to everyone involved there. It's For great sure. to hear. Okay. Can I ask the, the 
Yep. Um, Councilor Salter. Just a, just a quick question regarding your stats and, and how the changes have been happening. Somebody moving to Port Alberni, when they look at this, right, they don't know how the reporting's been changed and stuff like that. How can we get that message out to anybody that's looking at this community? When they see something like this, they go, whoa, you know? And, and we're not the only one that has the stats like, mm -hmm. like which is presented to us. So I'm just kind of curious to know. Yeah, we need to be uh, very careful because we don't want to diminish our statistics either. Mm -hmm. uh, that increase in assaults is real. Uh, this is not a change in the scoring, save except maybe one or two, but that's a significant uh, uh, increase. Um, I am confident in the weeks to come uh, there's going to be some media discussion about this and if we don't see it uh, certainly I will uh, at the local level uh, put out a media release uh, to just describe the changes. I think it's going to take a year to really determine what the full effect of, of it is and um, but throughout the year we'll have discussions on it and then uh, certainly in January February 2020 uh, there will be many discussions on it. Thank you. And would you like to move receive the report? Sure. Madam Mayor, I move that the quarterly report from the RCMP providing information about current departmental operations be received. Second, Madam Mayor. All in favor. Carried. And on to bylaws. We have the first item from the Director of Finance Tax Rate 2019 Bylaw Number 4988. And this is the final reading of our tax rate bylaw. Councillor Corbeil, could you read this one? Yeah, Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the report of the public hearing held April 8th, 2019 regarding bylaw number 4981 be received. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. We're doing oh, pardon me. I, I jumped ahead. Didn't you read that? <laughs> Let's try that again. Uh, I wasn't going to notice. <laughs> I'd like to move that the tax rates 2019 bylaw 4988 right. be now finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk sealed with a corporate seal and numbered 4988. And second, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this? No. All in favor? Carried. And item two from the manager of bylaw services, um, the April 8th public hearing. Um, we have the report here. Council, are there any questions on the public hearing report? Seeing none, Councillor Corbeil, would you like to read this one also? Oh, a little deja vu. Um, <laughs> yes, Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the report of the public hearing held April 8th, 2019, regarding bylaw number 4981 be received. Is there a seconder? Second. And seeing no questions, all in favor? Carried. And zoning text amendment number T18, Hedges, bylaw number 4981. Councillor Corbeil, continue. That zoning text amendment number T18 hedges bylaw number 4981 be read a third time. The second, Madam Mayor. Okay, and any questions or comments? All in favor? Carried. And, and I'd like to uh, continue that zoning text amendment number T18 hedges bylaw number 4981 be now finally adopted. Signed by the mayor and clerk, sealed with the corporate seal, and numbered 4981. Is there a seconder? Okay. And seeing no questions, all in favor? Carried. Okay. Correspondence for action. We have a number of items. Um, number one, from the Trinity Anglican and Lutheran Church. A letter dated April 4th, 2019, from the Trinity Anglican and Lutheran Church requesting Council's consideration to waive the building permit fee for their accessibility building project. Councillor Haggard, would you like to make this motion? And then we Thank can you, discuss? Madam Mayor. I move that the letter dated April 4th, 2019 from the Trinity Anglican and Lutheran Church requesting Council for the City of Port, Port Alberni waives the $924 building permit fee associated with their accessibility building project be received. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. And questions? Yep. Councillor Solta. So I have a question. They um, say this is going to be, this is the emergency reception center. So why can we not forward this over to the ACRD for the emergency? They, they have money that they get and why can't this be put over to that department since it's going to, you know, the ACRD is going to have to move over there and that's where it's housed and I'm just kind of curious to know. 
So are you meaning, um, so just to clarify, yeah. they're talking about being a reception center, not moving the actual emergency operations center. No, what I, they are yeah. a reception center yes. and it's for an emergency. Yeah. And um, so they're looking at accessibility. Mm -hmm. There are grants for accessibility mm -hmm. yeah. that could be looked into. And also the emergency um, reception, reception in that could be come from the emergency planning, which we pay into, yeah. so why do we not forward that? I think that's actually um, a great idea to mm -hmm. at least start with forwarding it to the ACRD. Um, and I'm not sure if they have funds that they can give out in that way. Mm -hmm. I think they're asking for, um, it's a building permit fee with the city of Port Alberni, so the natural is for us to waive it, but if it is an emergency response, an emergency preparedness function, we could at least um, mm -hmm. try that route and see what happens. Mm -hmm. We have um, supported them as well, um, not financially, but through um, resources helping them apply for grants um, for the same project. So um, it's something that we've been involved in from the city's perspective. Mm -hmm. So, uh, would you like to make a, an amendment to the motion? Sure, Madam Mayor. Um, I would like to amend that we forward it to over to the CRD for the emergency planning. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. And any questions? Just okay. Just one, just one more thing on this project. They wouldn't be. The, yes, they are putting an accessibility ramp in for members too. But if it's for emergency use, then we should be able to partner or that the emergency system pay, takes over paying. Sure. Any comments over here from staff? <laughs> uh, only comment I have, Madam Mayor, it's not a, an amendment to my motion. This okay. is a brand new motion. Um, and oh, I think it's, it's fair. And I think it's clear at this point that they are not an emergency reception center, um, but they have been in discussions mm -hmm. um, with mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the regional district that it could potentially be a good venue for you know, such a thing. So I think it's a it's a it's a good motion. Okay. Um, also, from the city's perspective, as a church, um, they are statutorily exempt from paying taxes, mm -hmm. and so they also receive permissive tax exemption for the land surrounding the building and the land that is utilized um, for the church. So the city does, you know, contribute as for well. Sure. Yep. Okay. So Thank fair you. motion. And process-wise, you want it to be a separate motion instead of it is, you receive just, you and just, forward. Um, yeah, you've just received the, okay. the, the letter as it is, so a standalone okay. motion to forward to the okay, regional okay. district is, okay. is good. Okay. We haven't received the letter yet, though. We haven't voted. <laughs> That's why I'm not the clerk today. <laughs> <laughs> not today. <laughs> okay, so on the motion so, to receive, yeah. all in favor? Carried, and make that motion again. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Mayor, I move that the letter dated April 4th, 2019 from Trinity and Anglican and Lutheran Church requesting council for the city of Port Alberni, waive the 925, be forwarded over to the ACRD emergency. Excellent, is there a seconder? Second. Okay, any further questions? No. All in favor? Carried. Okay, and item two from Jamie Laporte, an email dated April 17th, 2019 from Jamie Laporte requesting council's consideration on the implementation of traffic cameras at busy intersections, as well as the city's plans for dealing with industrial truck traffic. Councillor Haggard, would you like to read this motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the email dated April 17, 2019 from Jamie Laporte regarding the implementation of traffic cameras at busy intersections and plans for dealing with industrial truck traffic be received to the issue of traffic cams forwarded to the advisory traffic committee and the mayor and CAO invite Mr. Laporte to meet to further discuss his concerns regarding commercial truck traffic. Is there I'll a second that. Okay. And any questions or comments? Councillor Solda. Just a quick comment. I actually do like the idea of the traffic cams on, on major intersections, and I think it would benefit our community because we have a million tourists going through our community. It would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, Council will know that throughout our strategic planning, um, truck traffic and a truck route, industrial road potentially, um, was a major theme that is came through as a high importance. So um, looking forward to getting together with Mr. Laporte to um, update on that. Um, on the motion, all in favor? Carried. Okay, and proclamations. Item one from the Alberni Valley Hospice Society, a letter dated April 5th, 2019, requesting that the week of May 5th to May 11th, 2019, be proclaimed as National Hospice Palliative Care Week in the city of Port Alberni. 
Councillor Corbeil, would you like to read this motion? Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the letter dated April 5th, 2019 from the Alberni Valley Hospice Society requesting that Council proclaim the week of May 5th through 11th, 2019 as National Hospice Palliative Care Week be received and the week proclaimed as requested. Okay, is there a second? Second, Madam Mayor. All in favor? Carried. And item two, Walk for Value Steering Committee, an email dated April 8th, 2019 from the Walk for Value Steering Committee requesting that April 24th, 2019 be proclaimed as Human Value Day in the city of Port Alberni. Councillor Solda, could you read this one? Madam Mayor, I move that the email dated April 8th, 2019 requesting the council proclaim April 24th, 2019 as Human Values Day in Port Alberni be received and the day proclaimed as requested. Is there a seconder? Second. All in favor? Carried. And item three, a letter dated March 29th, 2019 from the Alberni Valley Senior Services Sector Cooperative requesting that June 15th be proclaimed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and fly the World Elder Abuse Day flag at City Hall. Councillor Haggard, would you read this one? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the letter dated March 29th, 2019 from the Alberni Valley Senior Services Sector Cooperative requesting that Council proclaim June 15, 2019 as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and to fly the weed flag at City Hall be received and the day proclaimed the flag flown as requested. Second, Madam Mayor. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Carried. And item four, a letter dated April 10th, 2019 from the United Steelworkers, local 11937, requesting that April 28th, 2019 be proclaimed as National Day of Mourning and to fly the mourning flag at half mast throughout the week. Councillor Corbeil, would you read that one? Yes, Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the letter dated April 10th, 2019 from the United Steelworkers, local 1-1937, requesting that council proclaim April 28th, 2019 as the National Day of Mourning and to fly the mourning flag at half mast on April 28th and throughout the following week be received and the date proclaimed with the flag flown as requested. Thank you, is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. And any questions or comments? Councillor Corbeil. If I could, I'd just like to point out, uh, I know the uh, United Steelworkers are also holding a National Day of Mourning ceremony on April 28th and, um, and it's open to the public. Uh, every year, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand people lose their lives in Canada from work-related injury and illness. And I think last year in British Columbia, 131 people uh, lost their lives. So um, I ask everybody to, uh, on the April 28th to uh, think of people that have been injured on the job, but also to redouble their efforts to ensure nobody gets injured on the job. Um, uh, this April 30th will be the uh, five year anniversary of the tragic shooting that took place at the uh, sawmill in Nanaimo where uh, two people lost their lives and, and two others were, were wounded. So also workplace violence is something that we should always uh, keep in, in mind when we go to work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, all in favor? Carried. And item five, a letter dated April 17th, 2019 from Child Find British Columbia requesting that the month of May be proclaimed as Missing Children's Month and May 25th as Missing Children's Day. Councillor Solda, could you read that one? Madam Mayor, I move that the letter dated April 17th, 2019 from Child Find British Columbia requesting that Council proclaim the month of May as Missing Children's Month and May 25th as Missing Children's Day be received and the dates proclaimed as requested. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Nope. Can Sorry. I just make a quick comment? I thought you were pre-voting. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> um, I just wanna, I'm reading the letter that came and it says the most, uh, most recent reporting from the RCMP shows that over 8,000 cases of missing children were reported in British Columbia and over 45,000 cases in Canada. That's a lot, yeah. that's a lot and this is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. Okay, all in favor, again? Carried. No, no worries, that's great. Um, and just one, one item of informational correspondence, City Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so it's just the minutes provided from the Alberni Valley Museum and Heritage Commission uh, of their meeting held on March 6, 2019. 
Thank you. Councillor Haggard, could you read that motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that informational correspondence items numbered one through one be received and filed. Is there a seconder? Second. And any questions on the minutes? All in favor? Carried. Okay. And item K, report from in camera. We do have a report from in camera today. Um, so council is pleased to announce that after three days of bargaining, an agreement between the city of Port Alberni and QP Local 118 was reached. The agreement was ratified by Local 118 members on Monday, April 15th, 2019, and by council in today's in-camera meeting. The new contract covering the periods be beginning January 1st, 2019, and will expire on December 31st, 2020, 2023. The five-year agreement provides for a general wage increase of 2% per year in each of the first four years and 2.25% wage increase in the fifth year, as well as several very modest benefits enhancing and improving for new and part-time employees. It's wonderful news that this agreement was reached in such a short amount of time. To me, this demonstrates goodwill and respect between the City of Port Alberni and its employees. Thank you to the city staff and QP members that represented their respective organizations in the bargaining process, and thank you to each of our employees. Your ongoing dedication and help is helping to build a strong, vibrant, and healthy community, and we are proud to have you represent the city of Port Alberni. Do we need a motion, or do we just read it out? Okay. Thank you. Okay. And item L is council reports. And we have um, the reports outlining council and mayor's activities for the last period. Are there any questions on the reports? Okay, would you like to move receipt? I move, oh. I move that the council reports outlining recent meetings and events related to the city businesses as be received. Excellent. Okay, and seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried. Uh, under there's no new business unless anyone has anything to bring forward Councillor Solta. It's it's actually not new business, but I've I've had people say that they don't get to see the streamline that we have the video in that and I was wondering if we could put it on our Facebook page This is the link to watch the council meeting because they seem to not be able to find it on our city web page, so I <coughs> I think I it is. I believe we do that already. Yes. Right? It is? So it is so on, it's on my Facebook page, and I think the city put it up this morning as well. Okay. Our manager of communications does um, send out notifications and directs people where to find the video. Yeah. Um, and then immediately, or fairly soon after the meetings, it's available on our website as well. Mm -hmm. But certainly we promote the live streaming aspect as well. Yeah. I, th I think that's important. If they have a link, they can click it, and it just goes right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I did check, and it is okay. in the um, in the city post from this morning, um, or it's from a couple hours ago. So it is there. Um, people don't always get all of the notifications of our page, but if they go and look for it, it is there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah. I just thought I'd bring it up yeah. because I've had a few people ask no, me about that's great. it. The more people we can get watching, the better. I agree. Um, and on to question period, which is an opportunity for the public and press to ask questions of mayor and council. Does anybody have a question they'd like to bring forward? Come on forward. <laughs> When you get to the front, if you could just state your name and address for the record, please. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Cook. I live on McNaughton Street. I forewarned one of your council members I'd be coming. Um, the reason I wanted to come speak to council was uh, oh, I thank you, Mayor and council members, for letting me speak with you. Um, the reason I'm here was to talk about the what I'm going to call the new tourist attraction for the moment. It's the, uh, the, the pole to be carved down at the uh, Maritime Museum. I don't know if any of you have been able to go down there to see it. Uh, I think you were Mayor, Madam Mayor, you were there when it arrived, I believe. But uh, it's quite a bit changes now. Uh, the reason I came up was to, to see if the city of Port Alberni through council will, will provide some shelter for those carvers. Um, with the, the weather that's changing, uh, February we had nice and hot, and then last month is kind of damp, this month is mixed. Um, there's nothing there now to protect them from any weather, so I'm just wondering if Council uh, would ask uh, their staff to look at uh, providing some tents or something for the short term until the project's done. 
Uh, I, I believe it's going to get a lot of, t uh, of attention through those cruise ships that are coming in. So we want to make sure those people carving that pole will be uh, uh, stay healthy and protected from the elements. So I'm hoping uh, um, this council will ask the staff to look for something. As, as I said, an example would be the tents to cover them while they're working on the pole because it's it's going to be something from Port Alberni, mm -hmm. and and uh, to show that uh, all the parties who are participating in and and supporting it in whatever fashion it may be, it would be great for Port Alberni. Thank you. For sure. Thank you. And um, just to let you know, we were asked for um, some funding to build a shelter. Um, and it was a pretty significant amount of funding, so we have forwarded it to our um, community investment program, which we just funded with some money from the community forest, um, so we thought that could be a good fit for it. But um, we haven't talked about a, a temporary kind of tent-like shelter, so that's something we can definitely um, pass on to our Director of Parks, Recreation, and Heritage to see if there's an option for something like that in the short term. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Would any other members of the public like to speak? Everyone's just here to watch. <laughs> okay, seeing no one, um, would somebody like to move to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Carried. <laughs>